everybody. Hi there. Welcome back to Planet and God. We are on Matthew 27. We've made it 27 chapters in, almost to the new year. We're going to wrap this up tomorrow with chapter 28. Yep. Groovy. If you've been able to stick with us, that's awesome. Congratulations. Um, if not, that's okay too. Go back, watch all the old videos, read the, the Gospel of Matthew, and find out why we celebrate the Christmas holiday. That's the whole point of this, is to know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that much better. And so, uh, let's dive in. Yeah. Matthew chapter 27. So, chapter 27 opens up with, it starts with this in verse 1, when the morning came. I thought that that's very key to note, is that the, the Jews had finished their part of trial. They had cast judgment on Jesus, breaking multitude of their laws in doing so, and now we've reached the morning. So it hasn't even been a full 24 hours. It's maybe been 6 to 12 hours that since all of this happened. So the new day dawns, the religious leaders take Jesus to Pontius Pilate to try and get him sentenced under Roman law because the Jews had their ability to execute people removed from them. So only the Roman authorities can act on and impose the death penalty. So in order for them to do that, they had the Jews have to convince Pontius Pilate that Jesus Christ did something that is worthy of the death penalty under Roman law. And so that's how this chapter opens up. And then we get into uh, verses 3 through 10 with Judas. Yeah, I um, specifically like verses 3 to 4 where it says that Judas was remorseful. Yeah, I, I noted that as well. And he tried to give the money back. He threw the money on the floor, and then and then that's like, you know, he hung himself after that. Right. Now, what's interesting with Judas is him being remorseful was not remorseful to salvation. It was not a repentance of salvation. In the Greek, there's two words for repentance. You have metanoia, which is... Re- the true repentance, change of mind, that's used in a sense of salvation, right? I changed my mind about who Jesus is, about what the Bible is, and now I repent. I changed my mind about God, right? And then there's um, metamelima, metamelii. Um, This is to be filled with great regret or remorse, remorse in an emotional experience. I am emotionally sorrowful that I broke the ornament on the Christmas tree. I wish she had that. Um, Judas recognizes his own guilt in the matter of convicting an innocent man, but in this case, he is self-loathing for his sins, not repenting of his sins. So it's just a, a very key thing to note in here that Judas is not repenting for salvation. He's remorseful, he's sorrowful that he did something to cause harm to an innocent man. Um, And then him throwing, thank you. That him throwing the money into the sanctuary is fulfillment of prophecy of Zechariah 11. I was just gonna say that too, because I, more prophecy is being fulfilled. Exactly. Out there. <clears throat> Beat me to it. I did. Um, and then as you said in verse 6, he went and hanged himself. Um, this was actually very critical for the, the Jews, the fact that Judas hung himself. If you remember in the last video, I made mention the fact that Judas had two tasks for being hired. One was to identify Jesus for arrest, and the other was to serve as false testimony or serve as the witness in front of Pontius Pilate. Now he's dead, and he can't fulfill that second task, right? That's gone. So now the, the he's not able to testify before Pontius Pilate, and so the Jews have to come up with a different way to 
convince Pontius Pilate that Jesus is worthy so of death. So then we go on to what verses 11 through 13? I went 11 through 26. Okay, because I didn't really go through those. I, I, just, I don't have anything until verse 18. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Okay, well then I'll just keep talking and you can sprinkle in thoughts as we go. Sure. All right. So now you have Judas before Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea. The Jews had convicted him of blasphemy which is punishable under Jewish law. However, Jews don't have permission. They can't execute capital, ju capital judgment, so they have to convince Pontius Pilate that Jesus is worthy of death under Roman law. The charge before Pontius Pilate is that Jesus claims to be king of the Jews. So the Pharisees are trying to say that this Jesus is claiming to be the king and therefore usurping Caesar's authority. So they're trying to convince him of the fact that Jesus is trying to rebel against the empire um, and, and start that like a civil war, if you will. And so, however, Jesus does not answer the fabricated charges. He doesn't respond to them because they're false. They're not true. Um, and then in an attempt to free Jesus, Pontius Pilate offers a prisoner, Barabbas, to the crowd. Now, it's really cool about Parabbas. Not, I mean, it's, it's cool to learn this. Not cool as it's all oh, that's... It's cool that this happened, but it's cool just to learn it. Um, Barabbas was an insurrectionist, a rebel, and a murderer. Barabbas was not his name, but it was a title. It's broken up into two parts. You have Bar, which means son of, and then Abba the father. So his title, Barabbas, is son of the father. Um, from outside sources, outside so outside of biblical sources, we find out that his actual name in the Aramaic was Yeshua bar Abba. So Jesus, son of the father. That was the name, right? That's very he, interesting. It's, yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. He has the same name as Jesus. <clears throat> However, Barabbas is carrying the title Son of the Father. Whereas Jesus, Yeshua, is Yeshua of Nazareth. Right? Barabbas carries that title, Son of the Father. Which Don't is, they look at Barabbas as like part, like where, so when you look at the Old Testament, um, things that they did within the priesthood stuff, um, that he would be considered the scapegoat? Yeah, he, w he would be essentially considered the scapegoat, which is very interesting. He carries the same name as Jesus. He carries the title that Jesus technically has because Jesus is right. the Son of the Father. Um, and then Barabbas is guilty of everything that the Jews are accusing Jesus of. Mm -hmm. So... It's just very interesting that you have this, this, that this is the man that is chosen to be the replacement for Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, and then that brings me down to verse 20. If you want to sprinkle anything oh, in. Oh, well, I just had for verse 18, um, for he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. So, right, they were jealous of him. Yeah. I just, you know, thought that was an interesting thing to see in there. And that, um, you know, that motivation obviously is not good motivation. Right. <laughs> Envy is not a good way to be motivated to do something. No, it's and not. That's exactly what they were using to motivate you know, their right. decision to do this. So. Yeah, no, then that's, um, and okay. that's nothing else. Okay. Um, I want to read verse 20 here, and it says, uh, But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Right? You have the Jews, the leaders, calling out from the crowd, convincing the crowd to push for the death of Jesus Christ and the release of Barabbas. And that it's just a very interesting correlation because now you have the leaders that are leading the people in the death of the Messiah. When we get to the second coming, Jesus will not come again until the leaders lead the people in 
calling out to the Messiah, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Right. So it's just a very interesting dichotomy, if you will, or change of events that has to occur there. So now the Jews have called for and accepted the death sentence of Jesus Christ. Oh, I thought it was interesting, verse 24, uh, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult, tumult was rising, uh, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, you see to it. Um, and that's exactly what the priest said to Judas, that yeah. you see to it. I don't know, I, it stood out to me for whatever hmm. reason. Probably has nothing to do with anything. But, right. Um, I did think it was interesting that, right, He's basically saying, my hands are clean. Yeah. I'm not going to do anything in regards to this, really. But he does, obviously, because yeah, he's kind of in a weird spot. He is in an odd spot. You know, and I think because he's politically trying to be correct. Right. He, he knows is... that Jesus is innocent, but at the same time, he knows that he sees what's happening. Right. And by releasing this innocent man is going to cause a greater... Uproar, right. uproar and so he he doesn't want the rebellion of the jews he wants to keep the peace right because if he doesn't he, he loses his head essentially right but uh at the same time he he doesn't want to convict jesus of death because right. he knows he's innocent yeah i just thought that was interesting and it gives you a little insight into like who Pilate is yeah a little bit a little so. bit uh, so verse 25, it says, And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. And I thought that that was so interesting where it, because it's the generations, right? And it kind of, I mean, it stinks that they're putting this on their... Yeah, their children. I mean, you think about that's the nation of Israel, and that's exactly right. what is happening, right? It's been put on the generations that follow, and again, going back to that prophecy where they, it will be the leaders that have to say, yep. you know. That will lead the people. Right. Yeah. Um, that it is through all the generations of their children's and that his blood is on them. Right. Which would make sense why the prophecy says this generation. Mm -hmm. Right. This generation put it also on all their children's generations. Yeah. So anyway, I thought that was... Um, interesting. Not a nice thing to do. And not a nice thing to do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Matthew just moves quick into it. Like, there's no toying around. He gets right into right. what happens next, verses 26 through 31. This time now you see Jesus is beaten again. He's been beaten a couple times already tonight. This time it's by Rome. And... Many do not survive a Roman scourging, right? Uh, typically, they would use an item called a cat of, nine, cat of nine tails. It's a whip that has nine ends, each with something sharp on it. Metal, glass, bone fragment, rocks. And so this, and it was long. It would, when you get whipped with it, it would wrap around your body, grab hold of some flesh, and God would pull it back, and it would just rip. It's terrible. Yeah, it is a terrible. It's and hard to even think about it is. And so most people do not survive that. But, you know, Jesus in, is in full control, right? He is the one that gives up his spirit right. at his timing. So he survives it. Um, after he's beaten, he's then mocked by the garrison, and they give him a number of things. They put on a scarlet robe on him. They put on a crown of thorns. They mock, they spit, they beat him repeatedly with a reed. And what's interesting with the scarlet robe, so Jesus was just scourged. He's got all these open wounds, right? You okay, Ben? <laughs> okay, she's good. Jesus was just beaten. He's got all these open wounds. And so this robe starts, right, when you put a band on an open wound, right? What happens? Your it starts to coagulate and it like and sticks, sticks to, to it. it. It's like uncomfortable. And uncomfortable, but then they rip it off. It's like ripping off a bandage prematurely, and so all this coagulated blood comes with it, and that's just even more suffering. Yeah, just it awful. is crazy. What 
the Messiah went through to redeem us from sins. And that's just the beginning of it, right? Um, we've, we're, we're halfway through. You get into, now we're in verses 32 through 34. You have Jesus is now led to Golgotha. That's the Aramaic word for location. The Greek is Karanotopos. And the Latin, which is what a lot of churches use to name their churches, is Calvary Locus. So the mountain of Calvary. That's where that word comes from, Calvary. It's from the Latin. Mountain. And we also see another prophecy being fulfilled just a couple verses down where um, his garments get divided. Yep. They cast lots. They cast lots for the garments. I believe that's Psalm 22 that speaks of that prophecy. So for a long time, I didn't know what cast lots meant. So maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So casting lots, thank you for that. Uh, oh, wow. Now I've got the Greek up. Um, casting of lots, essentially it was a practice where, uh, kind of like, um, what's that, that game where you have it a cup and you... It makes me think of gambling. It's kind of like gambling. Mm -hmm. But you know that game where you have a cup and you have dice and you put the dice in it and you shake it up oh, and roll Yahtzee? it? Yahtzee? Yahtzee! Yes! Yeah. <laughs> It's So casting lots is kind of like Yahtzee, where you have dice, effectively. They're, you know, things with symbols on them. You put them in a cup, you shake them, and you throw it down. And whatever comes up, it's like you're going to win something, or right. you you they would have special meaning to them sometimes. And so you'd, you could use it to make decisions, right? You'd cast the lots, and... Yes or no would be like one dice, a two-sided dice, if you will. Right, or different colors, and each person picks a color or something like that. Yeah, I don't think they use colors, but they use probably... I mean, they had maybe. colors back then. Oh. I, mean, I, I mean, they made colorful, Yeah. like purple, like royalty, maybe. you know, were purple. But essentially, <laughs> yeah, in this instance, it would be kind of like gambling. They would be gambling for the clothing of Jesus. But that's exactly, I mean, for a long time, though, I did not know what that was. Yeah. Then it was explained to me, and I was like, oh. Yeah. Different. Um, then he's given, or tries to be given, the sour wine mixed with gall. Now, what's interesting about this is it's kind of like a drug. It's something that they would give to people that they're nailing on the cross because it lessens the pain and it makes them lightheaded. So it kind of like gets you a little tipsy and drunk. Now, Jesus refuses that because he needs to be in full control. He needs to be aware of all of his senses, feeling everything, experiencing everything. He needs to know what's going on, so he knows what to say. That's, I think one thing that's very interesting with Matthew's account is I don't believe Jesus responds too much, if I remember right. He doesn't say too much while he's on the cross in Matthew. No. But Mark, Luke, and John record no other things. Yeah. Yeah, the the things that Jesus says on the cross. <laughs> so he refuses so that he can experience everything, still be in his mind, right mind, and say what he needs to say while he's up there. Um, that brings us to thirty five through forty four. You have. Well, we kind of talked about that because that was the cast lots, and then we talked about. Oh, you jumped into that a little bit. Oh, ahead of you? you Sorry. You did well, you in did you jump were... in as well. I did? We both oh, talked snap. about casting lots together. No, <laughs> uh, I guess. All right. Uh, continuing on, a few more things to note. In 35 through 44, you have um, mockery of Jesus prior to his death. Um, all the people in Matthew's account who mock Jesus mock different aspects of his public ministry. So the Romans, with the inscription, Jesus, the King of the Jews, they're mocking that. The passerbys, right, they mock him with, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days. The Jewish leaders, he saved others, he cannot save himself. And then the others that are crucified will mock him similarly, right? So they're all mocking him for different things that Jesus did during his public ministry. All of these are done to challenge Jesus effectively. You think of the spiritual war that's going on right now, right? Satan, this is his last ditch effort to get Jesus to renege on being the atonement for our sins 
and disqualifying himself as the Messiah. Right. If he can do that now, game over. There is no salvation, no repentance of sins. So what does he do? He sends in these mockers to challenge Jesus on the cross to get him to come down. Now we've seen throughout this book the power that Jesus had. We've heard Jesus say to Peter, if I commanded my father, 12 legions of angels would come and destroy everything. Think how much Jesus staying on the cross actually proves that he is the Messiah. And proves just how much he loves us. It does. Right? He must die first, and then he can come back to claim the kingdom. It's very cool. It is very cool. Seeing him on the cross just proves, and him staying there, proves that he is the Messiah. So now we get into 45 through 50, the death of the Messiah. Um, just an interesting note that at verse 45, I want to read it. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all of the land. One thing I found really fascinating when we did our Life of the Messiah study, uh, I found out that there were three archaeological records of darkness during this time. I thought that was super fascinating. These are extra biblical and from different regions across the area. There's one... Well, and it's noted, but they're not... It's outside of the Bible, so it's historical. They're historical, right. Yeah. These are historical evidence of darkness during the death of, of Jesus Christ. So there's two that come from Egypt, from two different guys, uh, Dionysus and Diogenes. Diogenes says that there was a solar darkness of such the like that either the deity himself suffered at that moment or sympathized with one who did, which is really cool. And then there's another one from Asia Minor, that's what would be today Turkey, from a Roman named Philagion, 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 yeah, you'll see, I'll fly it up. Um, he notes that the sixth hour, it was as if the darkness of night, night had uh, had come, and that there was a great earthquake that overthrew many houses. Well, and you have to think it's a little further down, isn't it? I think where it talks about that's when the veil is torn. Yep. Right. When the earthquake when he dies, there's an earthquake, the yeah. veil is torn, darkness over the land, right? So now you have extra biblical accounts, historical archaeological accounts of those same events happening across the region. Yeah. It's just fascinating. Just more proof. Exactly. Yep. Um, and then that brings us to the last statement of the Messiah in verse 46. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus quotes Psalm 22, and he's applying it to himself here. Then we get the last mockery of Jesus before he gives up the ghost, right? Then verse 49, the bystanders don't understand what he's saying. They think he's crying out to Elijah, that Elijah will save him. They think he's delirious, so they give him a sponge with that mixture in it. The idea, and this is the sickness of the Romans and, and crucifixion, they wanted the people on the cross to linger so that they suffer. And so the point of giving him, trying to give him that mixture right now is to keep him alive a little bit longer so he could suffer longer. Um, but he refuses and instead yields up his spirit. Now note that... Verse 50, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. He did it. Right. He yielded up his spirit. He was in full control and chose the moment that he would die. Yeah, it just goes to show that he, like you said, he was in full control and that no man can take the life of Christ. Right. It was his choice. Exactly. That brings us down to verses 51. 
51 through 56, um, we have signs that follow the death of the Messiah. You have the temple veil is torn. We already talked about this. Yep. The earthquakes that rock the land. We talked about that. The dead saints and the believers that are resurrected. Okay, so I find that I don't... Okay, so I know we talked about that within our... Through the life of the Messiah Yeah, we talked well. about it a little bit then. But I still, to me, that's like so crazy. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, studying further, uh, I, the way that I've come to really understand it now is that this event, the dead saints coming back to life, just portray the concept that through the death of the Messiah brings life. Yeah. Right? It's because of his death Which let's... that we have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Yeah, let's... I mean, we could read it because anybody who hasn't read it yet, but it just says, And the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So just noting that um, I completely agree with what yeah. you said, that it's it's a picture of... You know, what his death actually brings. Yeah. Life. Yep. And then the Roman guards, the reaction of the Roman guards in verse 54, truly this was the Son of God. Yeah, it caused people to believe. Yeah. I, I love that too. It is. Right? So it's everything that happens, I feel like there's always that purpose behind it and God's telling us, like, there's a reason. Yeah. And a lot of times that reason is just to give him glory. Exactly. And to bring people to him. Wrapping up this little section here, you have, um, we get some insight into who was with Jesus at his death. You have many women who followed Jesus. You have Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebdi's sons. So these are just some of the women. Other gospel accounts include others, name others as well. But this is who Matthew accounts for. Right, which these sons are James and John. Right. right. Yeah. Which so this would, have would been be Jesus's cousins. Right. So, so that's aunt. Jesus's aunt. Salome, I believe, was her name. And then wrapping up this chapter, whoo, it's a big one. Uh, Fifty-seven through sixty-six, we have Joseph of Arimathea receiving the body of Jesus Christ. He provides for a proper burial for him. Um, it's, it's, you don't get much interaction. We don't hear about Joseph in Matthew's account until now. But Joseph was a Pharisee who came to faith. I believe he came to faith in who Jesus was. Understood that he was the Messiah, or is the Messiah, I should say. Well, it says who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. Exactly. So I agree. Yeah. And I think, too, like that just goes to show... Cause um, I can't remember where in Matthew, but it talks about the rich man that yep. couldn't come to Christ right. in that moment. And it just showing that it's not the fact that like he was rich or poor, right? Because he... Right. Because well, he Joseph had to be rich because he bought a right. tomb yes. just for Jesus. and. But just noting that like that's not what made it, right? right? It's not whether you're rich or poor. Right. It's where your heart's at in making decisions and things for the Lord. Right. So I just, because he was a rich man, obviously, when right. he was able to purchase those things. I mean, and the Lord provided in that way for yep. that situation. But anyway. And then you have the Pharisees. They go and they attain a guard because they are fearful that the disciples of Jesus are going to steal the body and claim that he was resurrected. Right, because Jesus said, I will raise my de myself after three days. So in their fear, they go and obtain a guard. Pontius Pilate. I just find this part of, like a little funny. <laughs> well, what's really funny is when we get into it in 28. So you have them, just keep this in the back of your mind when you go to read chapter 28. That you have the Pharisees are afraid that Jesus' disciples will steal the body and claim that he was resurrected. And so they receive a guard. They seal up the tomb. This is a Roman seal. 
These are Roman guards. Them leaving and the seal being broken would equate their death. Right, so the guards would officially have to die. Right. Yeah. The guards are going to take their job seriously right here. And, so, and that's why they do this. Just keep this in the back of your mind when you go to read 28 because it's really funny what happens then. That wraps up chapter 27. Yeah. So, go read 28. <laughs> read 28. And then we'll see you in the next video. We'll see you there, and we will discuss our thoughts on 28. Yep. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.